Hey, I gave you the sign. <laughs> Oh, you gave me the sign. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I now I see. I already shared the screen. Sorry for. Uh, yeah. And you and so you already shared the screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me uh, let me let me let me um, uh, start the session. So it is a you know it is a great pleasure to uh, to chair this session. I'm expecting uh, you know another set of wonderful uh, papers. Uh, I mean we know they're uh, a set of wonderful papers. The title of the session is Money Creation in Decentralized Finance. A dynamic. Um, uh, sorry, this uh, title of the session is. My screen moved. Oh, there's okay. So we have uh, a great three papers. Uh, the first one will be presented by Simon uh, Mayer, and uh, just kind of to uh, you know to 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 get some anticipation, we are going to have Simon Mayer, uh, Daniel Robetti, and Gustavo Schwenkler presenting with uh, Fahad uh, Saleh, Alfred Leher, and uh, Dong Washin uh, discussing the three papers. Um, also, a word of uh, you know apologies. Uh, I'm not going to speak much because that's not my role in the session. But uh, whenever I do speak, you may uh, you may hear um, unworldly uh, sounds from the background. Unfortunately, I'm at home with my kids in quarantine, and there's little I can I can do about it. But I will try to keep it at minimum. So uh, with that, Simon, uh, please take it away. You have 20 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Hannah, for introducing. Thanks to the organizers, and especially Evgeny, for including this paper into the conference. This is joint work with Ye Li from Ohio State University, who discussed the paper previously in this section, uh, session. It was actually Hannah's paper. So today we'll be presenting money creation in decentralized finance, a dynamic model of stable coins and crypto shadow banking. In 2008, Bitcoin essentially heralded a new era of digital payments. However, the price volatility of Bitcoin and of other cryptocurrencies drastically limits their function or use as a means of payment. A more recent phenomenon is the rise of decentralized finance. Decentralized finance offers blockchain-based alternatives to banking, brokerage, or exchanges, as discussed in the previous presentation by Alfred. For instance, you can do collateralized borrowing, decentralized exchange, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and many other things within a DeFi um, ecosystem. Especially with the recent growth of decentralized finance, there's also been a simultaneous growth in the demand for blockchain-based safe assets, so-called stable coins. And the reason is that many DeFi activities simply require a stable blockchain-based safe asset. To give you an idea about the growth of decentralized finance and uh, stable coins, I show you on the left panel here the total value locked in lending, which is one decentralized finance activity, the right panel is the total value locked in decentralized exchanges, which is another decentralized finance activity. And yeah, the growth was tremendous over the last year, essentially. And um, well, the numbers might seem small at this point. We are like, if we add this up, we are roughly at 100 billion, but the growth is like very quickly. At the same time, the market value of stable coins has grown at similar speed uh, with the total market cap of stable coins. I think it's around 140 billion US dollars as of now. So this number I should have updated here, it's 153 billion. I'm sure it might be different um, as of this presentation. So what are stable coins? Stable coins are essentially cryptocurrencies packed to a reference unit. And most of the times, this reference unit is the US dollar. Who issues these stable coins? Well, I distinguish between three different types of stable coins. The first type is issued by so-called stable, is, is issued by specialized stable coin service providers. The most famous one or the most controversial one is Tether or Tether Limited. And uh, another uh, essentially um, uh, more recent stablecoin is issued by MakerDAO and that's the stablecoin DAI. Stablecoins also are issued to some extent by some established multinational networks. We have the JP Morgan coin issued by JP Morgan. Uh, there are several consortiums of banks and exchanges or a consortium led by Facebook that also consider the issuance of stable coins. No, most notable example is DM. And more recently, we have also discussed a lot about uh, central bank digital currencies, which is a stable coin issued by a central bank. China's Iren Mimbi would be an example of such a CBDC. How do these stable coins typically achieve stability? Well, um, most of the strategies to ensure stability rely actually on reserves or collateral. And typically, a uh, common theme within these uh, uh, proposals is over collateralization, which means that the reserves or the collateral in US dollar exceed 
the stablecoin value or the value or the amount of stablecoins outstanding also in US dollars. And then typically the stablecoin provider issuer conducts some open market operations to ensure price stability. Meaning when the price of the stablecoin is too low, then the stablecoin issuer buys back stablecoins, pushing up the price. When the price of the stablecoin is too high, the stablecoin issuer issues new stablecoins, driving down the price. What do we do in this paper? Well, essentially this paper is written to rationalize the strategies we observe in practice, stablecoin issuers deploy to um, ensure stability. And we also propose an optimal implementation of a stable coin. In particular, the strategies stablecoin issuers deploy involve open market operations, dynamic requirement of users collateral, stability and transaction fees, and the issuance of equity tokens, governance tokens. So we also, our model also lends itself to an evaluation about the stability or regulation of these stablecoins, and in particular about the stablecoin initiatives uh, backed by large uh, or big tech companies such as Facebook and uh, this, the associated stablecoin would be DM. And more importantly, we derive also some implications, some direct implications for the regulation of stablecoins. In this paper, we focus on the most common type of stablecoins, which would be an over collateralized stablecoin backed by risky reserves. How does it look? Well, in our model, we, uh, we essentially consider a dynamic model of over collateralized stablecoins, which are issued by a risk neutral yet financially constrained platform. And these stablecoins are essentially held by risk averse users who derive some convenience here from holding these stablecoins. And the users are risk averse because they value stability. The users can trade the stablecoins in the secondary market, and that includes the possibility that the users can trade the stablecoin with the platform, or they can trade against the platform, which is somewhat akin to redeeming a stablecoin. And what does the platform or the stablecoin issuer do? Well, the stablecoin issuer maximizes its equity value, and in order to do so, it dynamically manages its reserve assets, the stablecoin supply via open market operation, potential transaction fees or stability fees, or also the collateral requirements for users in that users may have to put down some risky collateral. Um, I give you now the balance sheet of two um, uh, prominent types of stablecoins in practice to just give you an idea how this looks. Let's start with the panel A on the left-hand side, which is a stablecoin simply backed by risky reserves. If we look at the balance sheet of the stablecoin issue, we have on the left-hand side, the assets, the reserve assets, and these are typically risky. On the right hand side, we have the liabilities, which consist essentially of these stable coins. So stable coins, in essence, are a liability to the stable coin issuer. And we have also the equity value, which is the governance token. So think of governance tokens just as equity. What happens if there is a negative shock to these reserves? Well, then reserve assets decline with this negative shock and the equity holders, i.e. the governance token holders, observe this shock. And an example of the structure exhibited in panel A would be Tether, with the caveat that Tether doesn't have governance tokens, but has equity. Panel B is a slightly different stablecoin structure in which we also have a second line of defense, namely user collateral. On the asset side of the stablecoin issue on the right hand side, we have essentially collateral put down by users and reserved assets, which are owned essentially by the stablecoin issuers. How does it look? Well, in order to um, mint a stablecoin, any user has to put down some risky collateral backing the stablecoin subject to a margin requirement. So we have some margin on the liability side. What happens if there's a negative shock to collateral or reserve assets? Well, then part of this shock is absorbed by the margin, essentially by the users of the stablecoin, and another part of the shock is absorbed by the equity holders. So essentially, we have here two lines of defense. In our model, essentially, we show that the optimal platform strategies and the stability of the stablecoin crucially depend on the value of the platform's excess reserves. And the excess reserves is simply the reserve assets in US dollars, net the value of the outstanding stable coins, which are the liabilities. In particular, when the value of the excess reserves is high, the platform or the stablecoin undergoes a virtuous cycle. When the value of C is high, the stablecoin indeed is stable, which stimulates stablecoin usage. The stablecoin issuer charges low transaction fees and grows its revenues. Eventually, when the excess reserves become sufficiently high, the stablecoin issuer 
pays out equity dividends to its equity holders, potentially in the form of buybacks. In contrast, when the excess reserves are low, the stablecoin undergoes a vicious cycle. Under these circumstances, the stablecoin price deviates from the pack and there is price volatility. The stablecoin issuer levies high fees, but usage is low. As such, the reserves do not grow a lot. At some point, when the excess reserves fall sufficiently low, the stablecoin issues new equity to replenish its reserves. In particular, we characterize an instability trap. Despite over collateralization, stablecoins can break the buck and become unstable. When the stablecoins become unstable, the recovery back to the fixed exchange rate regime is slow. In particular, stability can persist for a very long amount of time. However, once the stablecoin becomes volatile and debasement occurs, the recovery is very, very slow. We also apply our model to evaluate essentially these stablecoin initiatives by big tech companies, in particular by Facebook. In 2019, there has been a heated debate about Facebook's Libra, which is our renamed to Dean. The concerns were mostly driven by the fact that Facebook already has a lot of data and that Facebook might attain a data monopoly uh, if it also collects transaction data from stablecoin usage. I know. So let me present now two facts. Well, the first fact is like well-established networks or um, such as Facebook have very strong network effects. And these network effects might tr uh, trickle down essentially also to stable coins issued by, um, by such large networks. Our model also uh, can integrate these network effects and essentially shows that these network effects are not a problem in that network effects improve stable coin stability. A second fact is that, well, Facebook collects a lot of data and it might be also the case that Facebook, um, I mean, Facebook would also benefit from collecting a lot of transaction data from stablecoin usage. We show that transaction data accumulation by the stablecoin issue actually poses a bigger problem in that it makes the stablecoin unstable or more fragile. And the 1st of November 2021, the US Treasury essentially released a report on stablecoins discussing potential stablecoin regulation. To add to this report, our model essentially provides us some, uh, some, some recommendations for regulation. In particular, we show that essentially a requirement to full price stability is not necessarily beneficial. In particular, it is good uh, to leave the stablecoin issuer some flexibility in debasing the stablecoin price. Similar to traditional banking, we propose that a reserve or capital requirement can be beneficial if properly designed. We know this type of regulation from banking, but nevertheless, our model can be used to assess what type of stablecoins should be subject to more stringent capital requirements. A user margin requirement, which is dynamic and decreases with the reserve specking the stablecoin can be beneficial too. Another regular type of regulation we propose is concerns privacy. In particular, we show that like restriction on the data collection by stablecoin issuers, in particular privacy requirements, improves the stability of the stablecoin. And last, we show that actually interoperability of a stablecoin in that it can be used uh, in many DeFi applications can also improve stability. So let me go into the model um, for the interest of time I skip the literature. The model is set up in continuous time and there's an infinite horizon. In the model, there is a continuum of users which, who discount at rate R, and these users hold stable coins essentially to derive some convenience here. The stable coin price is denoted PT in, in US dollars, which is the number rare, and importantly, the stable coin price is endogenous. So we don't make any ad hoc assumptions that the price always equals $1. It has to be optimal for the stablecoin issuer to maintain a price, and maybe the stablecoin issuer finds it optimal to um, let the exchange rate float, in which case we have some price volatility sigma p. There are some shocks to the reserves held by the stablecoin issuer, the set, which I will specify on the next slide. So what can the stablecoin issuer do? Well, the stablecoin issuer can always mint new tokens or new stablecoins, in which case the supply ST increases, and the stablecoin issuer can also use its reserves to buy back um, stablecoins, in which case the supply of the um, stablecoins decreases. And this is akin to open market operations, and this tool is used to essentially ensure stability of the stablecoin. So why are these stablecoins used? Well, it's a big debate, but 
we simply assume that like the, um, the users of a stablecoin derive some convenience yield um, from holding these stable coins, which captures essentially the potential use, the usability of these stable coins within DeFi or um, any other preferences that give rise to stablecoin usage. Importantly, we also assume that stablecoin users value stability, which gives rise to the concept of stablecoins in the first place. In particular, the utility these users derive decreases with the volatility of the stable coin. And stable coin usage then is effectively is captured by the aggregate holdings of stable coins by these users. And that's the volume, uh, that's the, we call it also transaction volume, that's the symbol NT. So the users optimize essentially, the users optimally decide how many stable coins to hold which gives then endogenously the stablecoin usage, NT in equation four. And the only thing we have to observe here now is like that, well, price stability is important in that stablecoin usage decreases with volatility of stablecoins. What does the platform do? Well, the platform maximizes its equity value and the platform holds reserves against the stablecoins. And these reserves are denoted empty and they grow with some return, rate of return R, they grow with stablecoin issuance. They grow with fee revenues. So the, essentially the stablecoin issuer charges the users of the stablecoin a fee. And importantly, the reserves are risky in that there are some shocks, in particular Brownian shocks to these reserves. And naturally these reserves fall with the dividend payouts the stablecoin issuer makes to its equity holders. And the stablecoin issuer maximizes its discounted value of dividends which is its equity value. So essentially uh, I run out of time, but like uh, what we essentially show in the paper is that all the strategies of the stablecoin issue and in particular the stability of the stablecoin are fully characterized by the stablecoin issuers excess reserves C. And this excess reserve C is the difference between the dollar value of the reserves of the stablecoin issuer minus the value of the outstanding stable coins, which is supply S times the price of the stable coins in dollars P. And at this point, I go actually to some plots and show how the stable coin issuer strategy depends on the value of these excess reserves. At this point, the note, we require over collateralization, meaning that these excess reserves must exceed zero. And these excess reserves will then vary between zero and some upper bound at which the stablecoin issuer pays out dividends. What this plot essentially shows is that uh, the stablecoin optimally is stable when these excess reserves are sufficiently large. However, once these excess reserves drop below a critical threshold, volatility arises and the stablecoin becomes unstable. The intuition is that the stablecoin issuer then offloads risk to the users of the stablecoin by making the exchange rate or making the peg essentially float. How does that uh, then affect stablecoin usage or what we call transaction value? Well, when the stablecoin is stable, transaction volume or stablecoin usage is high, simply reflecting that the users of a stablecoin value its stability. However, when the excess reserves fall below this critical threshold and the stablecoin becomes unstable, this transaction volume or stablecoin usage is low. The platform essentially also charges some stability fees. And these stability fees are essentially high when there's a lot of instability because the stablecoin issuer would like to charge high fees in order to regrow its reserves. In contrast, when the stablecoin, essentially when the excess reserves are high and the stablecoin is stable, the issuer even gives some subsidies to the users to stimulate further adoption and usage of its stable coins. So this plot essentially presents the results we have just discussed in a slightly different form. Uh, in particular, the middle panel is very interesting. The middle panel depicts the, the price of the stable coin. And the stable coin is essentially pegged to one US dollar. When the excess reserves are high, then this peg is indeed maintained. However, there is a peg discount when these excess reserves fall low and, become, and essentially approach the threshold zero. In this case, essentially, there's a peg discount in that the stablecoin price falls below one and there is price volatility. 
We also simulate essentially, we use our model to simulate and we, in this graph, uh, neatly illustrate some type of instability trap. In particular, it's useful to have a look at the upper right panel, which depicts the stablecoin price as a function of time simulated. It's like very heuristic here. But essentially, the stablecoin price is stable at one for a very long amount of time. But then some negative reserve shocks drive the stablecoin price below one. And then the stablecoin price fluctuates within a band essentially between 0 0.9 and 1. But it takes a very long time for the stablecoin price to recover back to the fixed exchange rate regime 1. We formalize this finding by essentially calculating the stationary density or the st distribution of states. In particular, the stationary density of excess reserves is bimodal, meaning that there is a large probability mass in states where the stablecoin is unstable, which captures this instability trap. Once the stablecoin becomes unstable, debasement occurs and stablecoin breaks the buck. It takes a very long time again for a uh, stablecoin to drift back to its path. On the other hand, when the stablecoin is stable, then it spends a lot of time in the stability regime, meaning that fixed exchange rate regime can persist for a very, very long amount of time. What I have- uh, Simon, Simon yeah. you should be wrapping up now. I wrap up, okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much for, um, thank you very much for the reminder. Let me conclude at this point in the interest of time. We develop a dynamic model of stable coins and crypto shadow banking, which is essentially the issuance of safe assets by stable coin issuer. Despite over collateralization, stable coins can become fragile and break the bug, which gives rise to an instability trap. Our model rationalizes several stability mechanisms we observe in practice, such as the dynamic requirement of user collateral, the um, use of platform reserves, token price debasement, or the use of stability fees and governance token issuance. Our model also gives some uh, uh, recommendations for optimal regulation of stable coins, in particular our model recommends capital requirements, dynamic user margin requirements, and also the privacy requirements that restrict a stablecoin issuer's ability to collect and process transaction data can be beneficial in that these privacy requirements improve the stability of the stablecoin. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions, comments and to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And uh, now the discussion uh, 